Barry School of Journalism, welcome to Global Journalist. I'm David Reed. There's nothing unusual about political fights over public school curriculum and the content of textbooks. The textbooks, after all, can influence how people think about history and social issues for decades or more. So the battles take place around the United States and they take place around the world. But the Texas Board of Education uh, recently took these culture wars to another level when members made highly controversial decisions on how evolution is taught in the classrooms. Director Scott Thurman's new documentary focuses on this Texan drama in his new documentary called The Revisionaries. Scott, welcome to the Global Journalist. Glad, glad you guys are bringing me out. Thanks. Before we uh, get uh, into our conversation, let's uh, start by playing a trailer for the film, which is being shown at several film festivals uh, in the United States in the coming months. Look around us and look at nature, look at all the plants, the complexity, look at us, look at our hand. It used to be you would look out and you'd see the God that created it all. And now, people walk outside and see blind, purposeless nothingness. History may be getting an overhaul in Texas, as the State Board of Education is set to vote on new curriculum standards. The new guidelines are splitting the state between those who say conservative politicians are trying to indoctrinate students, and others who say it's about time the state removed the liberal bias that they see in books. You've created a hornet's nest like I've never seen here. We're a bunch of lay citizens on the State Board of Education, and we want to make sure that our children are taught good, solid American history, and I uh, think we're in step with most of the majority of Americans. If you want to control and shape the politics of a state, controlling and shaping what students learn in public schools from age five through age 18 is a really, really smart strategy. My religion says that we're all created in the image of God. And because every little child is created in the image of God, I want to see that they have the best opportunity possible. The high school classroom is no place to fight the culture wars. What you are discussing now is whether you will teach the denigration of evolution, which is a long-time creationist strategy to promote creationism through the back door. We say on this day, your will be done in public education once again. I like to believe we are living today in the spirit of the Christian religion, governed by Christian principles. It will change the face of our state for decades to come. It matters. We have taken on the far left on the last several years, and we have won. We are turning education in a vastly different direction. So thank you. So Scott, you're a documentary is really character driven. You, you tell the story uh, really by uh, interviewing and showing these characters in action. Could you kind of describe these four main characters? Sure. Well, the main character is Don McElroy. Um, he would consider himself to be a young earth creationist and that would s simply mean that the, he believes the earth is 6,000 years old and that uh, you know man and dinosaurs walked the earth together. He sort of you know has that more fundamentalist um, evangelical approach to his re his religious perspective. Mm -hmm. um, there's Cynthia Dunbar, who's an attorney in um, Houston, um, who's on the board as well. She teaches at Jerry Falwell's Liberty Institute. Um, and so we have uh, Don McElroy and Cynthia Dunbar, who represent sort of the far right um, end of the spectrum. Right. Then we have two other characters that represent maybe more the left or moderate um, camp. And the first of those would be Kathy Miller. And Kathy Miller is a uh, uh, lobbyist uh, spokesman for the Texas Freedom Network. Um, and she's often at every meeting mm -hmm. sort of lobbying the State Board of Education. And there's Ron Weatherington, a uh, professor of anthropology at a Southern mm -hmm. Me Methodist University in Texas, who was very active politically in sort of um, helping the standards process. He was one of the content experts that reviewed the science standards. Right. And let's also talk about uh, you as a character. And you, you, I was looking back uh, at stuff that's been written about this film and about yourself, and it seems to me that the, the genesis of this uh, project may have taken place in your sixth grade science class. Yeah, you know, I had a really good science teacher in the sixth grade who inspired me. It wasn't necessarily, I think, about the sort of details of the, the scientific process or more the 
you know, the facts of science. It was, it was more that he inspired me to sort of look at things from a scientific perspective. Mm -hmm. And um, although I didn't really recognize that as a huge influence at the time, looking back on it, I can certainly see it played a heavy role in, um, you know, focusing on this documentary and initially starting a documentary on the uh, philosophical implications of evolution. Right. And you, th at this and then you went to school at the at, at you went to film school in Texas, mm -hmm. uh, getting your MFA, mm -hmm. and you this was uh, this started out as your your film project. To bring mm -hmm. us back to that point, yeah. So um, uh, the University of North Texas, I was in a graduate documentary filmmaking program, and uh, I started working on this documentary in my second year, and that was two thousand eight, and uh, carried on into my third year and, and developed into a thesis film. And so at that point, I was still sort of isolating the science issue. In fact, I had originally started just following a science teacher. I wanted to get into the classroom, but also talk more candidly with that science teacher um, out in, you know, sort of their, their everyday life about the, uh, uh, you know, evolution and sort of what role science can play in our everyday lives, how we can benefit from science. Um, it's not just sort of these cold facts, you know, closed in a classroom. Mm -hmm. Um, but I was, uh, ironically, being closed off from a lot of these classrooms from administrators who right. felt the topic of evolution was too controversial. They didn't want me in there. However, the teachers did, uh, you know, allow me. But since I was being rejected from many classrooms, I decided to, um, or not necessarily decided, but was um, forced to tell the story in a slightly different way. And that's when I started following the... Uh, board meetings, the State Board yeah. of Education. And it was pretty timely because they were just getting into this discussion. Absolutely. I right. came across an article in the New York Times about the State Board of Education, and I knew that if I switched to cover the State Board of Education in Texas, that I would have a much wider audience and I could reach a lot more people. And what was the uh, your kind of your original uh, vision for what this documentary was going to be? You know, I wanted it to sort of be more of a philosophical, like, study. A lot of talking, I get, you know, yeah. I didn't know at the time. It's just, in my head, it was, you know, interview a lot of experts and interview a teacher and show the teacher teaching in class. I didn't recognize, um, I didn't think about how boring that would actually be, you know, maybe right. interesting to those who are interested in that particular issue, but not really turning anybody on to it that might not be uh, right. particularly interested. Then the board started making some pretty serious decisions. Yeah, you know, and um, they, uh, they, were, they were at the time evaluating the science standards and the sort of process of the State Board of Education, which I guess I should say the Board of Education is made up of 15 members who are right. elected in partisan elections. They represent a particular district from Texas. And um, these, these board members are responsible for doing uh, – they, they've got a few major responsibilities. The biggest one is that they're, they're um, voting on standards for public schools. And those standards do two things. They guide teachers in the classroom. The teachers have to uh, teach these standards. They're mandated to teach these standards along with um, whatever individual curriculum their particular school district has added to that. So the standards guide the teachers, but they also are sort of serve as a gatekeeper for textbook publishers who want to sell their books in Texas. And as a lot of people know, yeah. Texas has a centralized buying market, which means the state buys the textbooks, and it, but first they have to be approved, and the State Board of Education approves those textbooks if they meet the standards. So textbook right. publishers have to meet these standards, and then they get, get on an approved list, and then public schools throughout the state can use these textbooks and, and have fr these free mm -hmm. textbooks paid for by the state, right. or they can pay for their own if they want to, if they've got the money, they can get any textbook they want. But if they want the free textbooks that the state buys, they have to be approved by the State Board of Education. Right. And this has also has wider implication because other states might follow uh, what Texas is doing? Is that right? Yeah, and so what happens is because... Um, Texas is such a big buying power. Publishers cater their language to the Texas standards in order to sell there and oftentimes don't republish different versions of those books for other states because it would be too costly. So they um, in turn you know, sell these textbooks throughout the nation. Now before we get into the specific this debate in Texas, let's let's uh, back up a little bit and talk about uh, kind of the evolution of the uh, this uh, fight over uh, 
Yeah. Teaching evolution and not letting uh, creationism in the classroom. Sure. Um, Yeah, to understand what's going on in Texas, you sort of have to understand the history of the creationist political movement. And I think maybe one start is to uh, to just recognize that in the 80s, creation science was ruled unconstitutional. In 2006, intelligent design, a concept that says things in nature are too complex to have evolved through un, through random processes that they had to have been designed by an intelligent designer. Well, that got ruled unconstitutional in 2006. They basically said it was creationism relabeled. Well, after that, the creationist political movement was to, um, quote unquote, teach the controversy or teach um, the sort of problems with evolution. And one branch of that in Texas was to teach the strengths and weaknesses of evolution um, to highlight what um, creationists saw as major problems with the theory of evolution. And then every 10, since every 10 years, the the Texas Board of Education revises the uh, uh, standards Mm -hmm. So this this was coming about as you were filming, and mm-hmm. then the topic of evolution came up. Tell us what happened then. Sure. Well, you know, um, uh, I was I was interested in covering evolution, and then the standards they were evaluating, you know, the science standards and and uh, debating the strengths and weaknesses. Um, throughout the debate, the language sort of shifted. It became analyze and evaluate scientific explanations rather than strengths and weaknesses. But many um, scientists felt it was sort of the similar language that um, would, in turn, uh, allow um, creationists. Um, uh, explanations for you know uh, what they saw as what should be scientific um, explanations of the natural world, um, but yeah, it got very heated in Texas right. during that point. Um, but I, I saw often though that people they just they didn't understand the the details of the issue. They well they they didn't understand that it was it was more complicated than the than f- maybe what we would consider religious right members um, bringing in creationism. It was, uh, the debate was much more nuanced and, um, you know, maybe sort of evidence of uh, evolution is in the creationist movement. Um, right, right. So because this this political strategy has evolved over time. Trying to um, at least get students to think more about creationism. Yeah, or, you know, open the door for what m- may be um, creationist sympathetic teachers to teach creationism in the classroom and it not be against the law because the standards sort of allow that. The language right. of the standards may allow that. That's what the right. scientists were worried. Right. Well, let's talk about what these four, the positions of these four characters, uh, and it sort of illustrates uh, sure. where the debate went. Um, maybe uh, let's start with, uh, with, with Don because... He was the, the central character. Mm-hmm. What, what were his views, and how did he get those, try to insert them into the the um, standards? Well, well Don, um, he's a young Earth creationist. As I said earlier, he believes Earth is um, less than 6,000 years old. And um, he, he's got some pretty fundamental uh, views. Um, but uh, he, he didn't necessarily bring his religious views into the debate per se, um, but many felt that he... Um, uh, uh, the underlining sort of intent of what he was doing was basically trying to get his his um, personal ideology in the, in the textbooks through particular um, uses usage of language. Strengths and weaknesses wasn't the language he used, but he debated you know on other amendments, um, talking about the complexity of the cell, or a concept in um, science um, called punctu or evolution called mm-hmm. punctuated equilibrium. Um, the idea that um, certain organisms sort of evolve very rapidly suddenly, but then sort of have a state of plateau of uh, stasis. And um, he would often explain these concepts in during boardrooms to other board members, and this infuri- infuriated um, scientists because um, he was he was, in his own words, standing up to the experts. Right. He um, he didn't want to be he didn't want to be a rubber stamp for what the science experts decided what science was. He wanted to have a place in his own views somewhat because he felt those were the views of his constituents. He felt that was properly representing the people who voted for him. And he's in his own way a very intelligent man. Right? He's he got an engineering degree. A, mm-hmm. a, he's a dentist. Mm-hmm. Um, but he's also a, an evangelist as well, right? Yeah, I think it's a common misconception for people to think that creationists are not intelligent people. Um, Don is a very intelligent person, engineering degree, he's a dentist, um, and 
more than that, Don is a very kind and endearing person, and I got to like him on a, a personal level and wanted to show that in the documentary. Now, and, okay, and, and then the, the lawyer. Uh, for, Cynthia. For, for Cynthia. Talk mm-hmm. about her. Yeah, Cynthia her Dunbar is arguably the um, sort of uh, maybe most intelligent on, on the board of, uh, from the far right. She uh, was, um, in her own words, the word, a wordsmith. She was crafting a lot of the language, the actual language. And uh, it was her that sort of took the strengths and weaknesses terminology and used a phrase from one of the scientists, analyze and evaluate. Well, she used that phrase, analyze and evaluate, but the scientists felt like she was using it to sort of also open the door for creationist inspired you know language right and the uh the anth- the anthropology professor was mm-hmm. uh, a big a main character yeah well. you know he was um he's he's my hero uh, ron weatherington he um uh, you know he's a professor of anthropology and he's a, an author of several books on evolution and i think what i admire so much about ron is that he took the time to go to these board meetings to be um, sort of as a, a his civil duty, you know, for the public, for the kids in Texas to make sure that sound science was being taught. And he, um, he just, uh, he, he was able to talk with Don and other board members in a very um, cordial way. He, he was uh, also um, just a very kind person and sort of didn't, uh, didn't sort of have that standoffish like I'm right, you're wrong. He was willing to engage um, a lot of the far right religious right board members, and that's what made him a crucial character in my story because I wanted this to be a conversation. I didn't want it to be a one sided, maybe more slanted perspective right. and right. Uh, opinionated perspective on the issue. And the the final character, the the woman who represented the organization mm-hmm. fighting the mm-hmm. uh, effort to change the standards. Yeah, so Kathy Miller is the president of Texas Freedom Network. They're um, an organization that has sort of countered the religious right in Texas, and um, she would attend board meetings and often, you know, give testimony at these board meetings and constantly talk with board members uh, to try to help, you know, the scientists be, I guess, you know, convey their thoughts you know, in, in, in what the board members were sort of proposing in these amendments. Right. So in the end, uh, the uh, conservatives won the fight. And what, uh, what is the impact of that? So um, these, these standards, as I were saying, they guide mm-hmm. um, the teachers and they influence uh, or they set regulate the textbooks. Um, but, you know, these things are in place for 10 years. So um, we're, these these are going to affect kids in public Texas and, and kids in public mm-hmm. schools in Texas for another ten years, and so I think that's a pretty um, major influence in terms of um, education. And as Cynthia Dunbar says in the film, mm-hmm. the philosophy. Well, she's quoting, I guess, yeah. uh, Lincoln, and or, or I guess a quote attributed to Abraham Lincoln that the philosophy of the classroom in one generation is a philosophy of the government in the next. And so, if you care about your freedoms, you care about the the you know the government of of your the mm-hmm. next generation. You got to care about education. It's extremely important. And, and uh, I don't want to. They did also. A, after you finished the evolution discussion, they also the conservatives also won in the subsequent battles over uh, uh, history and social sciences. Even more so in the social studies and history, they pulled off the victory. Um, and in the words of Kathy Miller throughout in the movie, she says, "Well, in science, they were able to hold off the religious right here and there." Um, because they had a few moderate Republicans sort of siding with them. But in the social studies and history standards, um, she felt as though the far right sort of won every amendment and sort of just, you know, waxed right. the floor with the, the Democrats and moderates. What do you hope to accomplish with this with this film? Now that it's, I mean, the Texas decision is done, mm-hmm. um, and there's nothing really can, that can be done about mm-hmm. that for a good while. Mm-hmm. So... Uh, what do you hope uh, audience members come away with? Well, we want we want as many people to see it as possible, and um, that was sort of my approach. I didn't want to preach to the choir necessarily with this this piece. I wanted it to sort of speak to the people that maybe 
just don't know about the Board of Education. Simply inform people about this political process. And so they know how their kids are getting the information in their textbook and how, what the teachers are teaching. And so I, I, I guess I wanted to um, allow for a conversation on this as well. I didn't want it to be an end-all debate um, to say, hey, this is how it is, here are the answers, and wrap it up in a nice little package and say that's it. This is an ongoing debate right. that will has been going. The evolution creationism debate has been going on since the beginning of time, mm -hmm. and or maybe since Darwin sort of proposed his theory, and will continue to go on. And so we need to engage in conversation. I didn't want to polarize the is right. issue with this film. And this is not um, uh, an issue just as I said in the opener. Um, just happening in the in the United States, mm -hmm. you know. I'm, there's several examples of other countries. Mm -hmm. uh, Japan um, recently had a fight over textbooks. Um, there have been some efforts in in Turkey, right? To yeah, you know. And, and uh, talk, let's talk about the the international. Uh, um, aspect of this. Sure. Well, you know, I have to admit uh, my, my knowledge is somewhat limited on the international sort of debate on this particular issue, but I do know that Turkey is another country that there's uh, been sort of a creationist movement rise and uh, uh, sort of attempt to influence um, education in, in their country. So As their government government becomes a bit more religious with an Islamic leader, president, right, uh, I suppose. Yeah. And, and, and Pakistan has had a, a similar fight. Um, so the uh, you know you're, and you're also you're going to be showing this film to internationally hopefully at some festivals. You know we're trying to, yeah. but you know they're not picking it up as much as Americans. American film festivals they recognize this as an important issue. Texas recognizes this as, this is an extremely important issue, and uh, so we're we're hoping to get it out there more internationally. But as of now, we still haven't had an international premiere of the film. And where, where's it showing in the coming months? Um, we are having a theatrical premiere um, this Friday um, in Dallas. So we're going to show it in Dallas. Um, the following weekend, we're going to show it in Houston. And uh, a few weekends after that, we're going we're gonna to open it up in New York and L.A. and uh, Austin, finally get it to Austin, right. Texas, where much of that this was filmed. How, how uh, when you showed this in, actually, when you showed this in, in Texas and you showed it to the uh, the people uh, involved in the film. How did how did the how did the uh, um, those four characters uh, react to the film? Um, surprisingly well, um, or, or maybe I should say not surprisingly well. I'd hoped that they would appreciate the film. All of them would, and that was my approach. I wanted to make an even-handed portrait of of everyone. And um, Don, of all of all people. Um, really does love the film. He thinks I did a good job. He's got a few objections here and yeah. there, but he thinks I did a pretty fair job. And so I'm, I'm proud that um, I not only have sort of uh, pleased him. I mean, it wasn't my goal to please him, but I know that if I could make an even-handed, or if, I could, if he would be okay with the film, I right. would know that it was a more even-handed portrait. Before we continue our discussion, I want to remind everyone that you can view or listen to this program anytime by downloading our podcasts at globaljournalist.org. You can also find interesting articles, photos, and interviews related to our program on our website. Please send us questions or comments via globaljournalist at kbia.org or our Facebook page. You can also follow us on Twitter under our new handle at globaljourn, global, J-O-U-R-N. Um, speaking of journalists, you uh, started out uh, doing as a photojournalist. Right? Yeah, I was. I worked in the news. We, we called them photogs. I was basically yeah. the camera guy that would go out on the shoots and and uh, you know do, put together packages and things like that. Right out of college, um, I'm sorry, right out of yeah. high school, I went to junior college and studied mass communications. Got a job working for a local news station and, and did that for several years. You know. Do you think that background affected your kind of your uh, decision to really? Try it an even-handed approach rather than rather than doing like a Michael Moore yeah, very I propaganda think, I'll tell you style a particular, documentary. A particular example I'll never forget. I went to um, get some footage of a particular incident of uh, a kid in Amarillo, Texas. That's where it was, and um, the the kid was accused of statutory rape in mm -hmm. another country. And um, I took the, the footage back to, um, just interviewed some of his family members and things, and took the footage back to the reporter who was putting together the package. And, um, I, you know, I wanted to know sort of what that reporter's slant on the issue was because I actually, you know, knew 
um, this this kid's uh, one of the the friends of this kid's parents, and so she had asked that I just you know present the the topic fairly, and so I wanted to know what was going on, and he just you know grabbed the tape from me and said you know what are you this is mine you know why are you worried about it and I I didn't want to be a worker bee I didn't want to be just a cog in the gear sort of um, mm. getting footage I wanted to, to control my message and so that's why I took such um, I think. Uh, took on multiple roles in the in the making of this. I was shooting. I was editing. I was I was um, directing initially in grad school for this project, and then later I got another uh, more professional editor and uh, uh, had another cinematographer sort of help me out. But um, I really uh, I think that moment sort of said to me, you know, I wanted to have more of a voice in the stories that are being told. I didn't want to just be a cameraman. Right. And so you, you, this, the uh, film has gotten good reviews, and it's, it's also got an award at uh, Tribeca. Is that right? Uh, mm -hmm. And and, and didn't, wasn't uh, Michael Moore involved with giving you an award as mm -hmm. well? He was on the jury there at Tribeca, and he gave us the special jury award um, and uh, has been uh, an advocate of the film. He's invited me to his own film festival in Traverse City, which was a wonderful experience, uh, getting to know him uh, a little bit there at the festival as well. And are you continuing to uh, uh, be connected to the characters in the film, Don in particular? Yeah, you know, I talk with Don about once a week, even now, and uh, he'll be participating in Q&As for some of these screenings in Texas. What um, Tell us about uh, kind of an evolutionary theme here, what, what your, the evolution of your feelings toward Don. As the movie progressed, well, you know, I, I I just advise everyone to to treat a topic sort of like a scientific experiment. You're you're test you're you're making tests, and whatever those results are, you're sort of creating your story from those results. So you're not creating a story to confirm your preconceived ideas, but you're it's a process uh, of under uh, of understanding and and get it and learning about what the topic is is about rather than sort of just finding the answers that you think you already know. So right. I thought Don, after reading some of the things he was doing, I thought he was, a, you know, just I didn't like what he was doing and I, I right. didn't think he was a very good person for what he was doing. But when I got to know him, I just found a very warm, endearing person that um, I like very much on a personal level, but I do disagree with uh, from from a political point of view. Right. And I guess people can find out more about the film on your website and maybe where it might be showing in case it comes uh, near here and also if it gets uh, distributed nationally. And, and the website, can you tell us your website? Uh -huh, TheRevisionariesMovie.com. Okay. And what's, your, what's next for you? Um, I may be working on another um, documentary on um, um, the uh, politics of education in Texas. And, uh, you know, I've got a few other projects I'm researching right now, but early stages. I'm not, I'm not very far along with anything at the moment. And uh, the... So the topic will be similar, do you think? Uh, perhaps. Rather than focusing on the State Board of Education, we might look at the state legislature and um, you know their process and uh, other aspects of education. Uh, for example, principals and uh, superintendents that may not be as well trained in, in you know the environment that is sort of growing and changing, um, as well as you know early childhood literacy. There there are multiple issues in education, but for, for of all all of that, I think the most important are teachers and well-trained teachers, and I think um, I'd like to focus on the teacher okay. in the next, okay. next film. Well, Scott, thank you very much for joining us today on Global Journalist. It's been a fascinating discussion. We've come to the end of this week's Global Journalist, produced by the Reynolds Journalism Institute and the Missouri School of Journalism. Our program is directed by Travis McMillan, audio by Pat Akers. Raymond Tungkar is our executive producer. Join us again next week for another Global Journalist. I'm David Reed. Press Watch, a segmented global journalist where each week we bring to you a rundown of major events affecting press freedom around the world. I'm Sravani Pere. This week's news comes from Committee to Protect Journalists, International Press Institute, and Reporters Without Borders. The editor-in-chief of Milan's Il Giornal was sentenced to 14 months in prison after Italy's Supreme Court convicted him of libel. Alessandro Salusti edited and published an article in February 2007 which suggested that a juvenile court magistrate should be sentenced to death penalty for allowing 13-year-old girl to have an abortion.
The magistrate complained that the article was defamatory and the Milan court ruled that Salusti was responsible for its publication. One of Cuba's most prominent bloggers was arrested on October 4th while heading to a court proceeding and detained for 30 hours. International Press Institute's World Press Hero 2010, Ioanni Sanchez, was arrested along with her husband, Rinaldo Escobar, and blogger Augustin Diaz. The blogger said to IPI that no reasoning was given as to her arrest except the claim that she would disturb the trial. She also tweeted that she was physically assaulted during the ordeal. Meanwhile, Ethiopian authorities detained a reporter working for Voice of America as she was covering Ethiopia's Muslim community. Marth Vanderwolf was following Muslim protesters demonstrating against alleged government interference in Islamic Council elections at the Anwar Mosque. Six journalists are reportedly detained in Ethiopian jails, making Ethiopia the second leader in jailing journalists in Africa after Eritrea. For more information on these and other events affecting press freedom around the world, please visit our website at globaljournalist.org. Thank you for joining us this week on Global Journalist. I'm Sravni Pere. See you next week.